we wrote these songs over and over again. We tore them apart and put them back together. We took pieces out of songs and that ended up working better for other songs. Uh, it's really been, you know, it was really like solving this intricate puzzle, putting this together, you know, finding out after we write one song, thinking about what, what the next song should be like and kind of piecing it all together was really a lot of work, but it was it was really fun and rewarding. What's up, everybody? It's Keefe at GhostCultMan.com. I am thrilled to be once again joined by John Henry of Darkest Hour. How are you doing, sir? I'm doing great. Thanks. Yeah, thanks for making the time. I really appreciate you. We are on the precipice. Big words for Friday morning out here. For me, uh, Perpetual Terminal new album coming out from Darkest Hour. Always a big highlight for us when a new record is coming out, as I'm sure it is a relief for you to get it done. Uh, it's been a crazy few years and, you know, first things first, hopefully everybody in the band is good, in a good place as we, you know, embark on this next chapter for the band. Oh yeah, we are super ready. It's been a long time coming, but we're finally ready to drop this thing on the world. In, and drop it indeed. It's heavy, man. It is a fantastic record. Uh, you know, I I, th I thought I saw something. I don't think it was attributed to you. There was a really funny quote. Well, not funny, but, you know, I thought it was a standout to me notion uh, might have, you know, that, uh, you know, the band would like this album to be immortalized by the fans the same as all the beloved classic records. So I love that. I love that vibe, actually. And I feel like there's a lot of just naturally classic sounding huge songs on this record. Yeah, that's definitely the goal. You know, we, we really wanted to kind of define the band as it is now, you know. Right on. I'm. Uh, I just saw you guys like, oh, uh, let's say a year and a half ago here in San Francisco at Bottom of the Hill. Maybe a little less than a year and a half ago. And uh, you know, it was a phenomenal celebratory night. You guys were playing an old album, and but at the same time, it felt like a vibrant band that still got a lot to say. This record's proof. I can't wait for people to hear it, as I like to say. But you know, I also feel like it. You know, everybody says their latest record is their best album, but clearly, I, I feel like there, this is a really deep record there's no skips it's very thought out well thought you know thoughtfully composed and created you know yeah well we had you know we had a lot of time to put into it and uh you know it's the first time we've done a real self-produced record so <clears throat> you know we were really able to you know just kind of write and rewrite and find what we needed with the album there was no rushing whatsoever kind of the opposite we really took our time to you know make the what you know what the perfect album for us right now word i love to hear that and uh a shout out to monarch heavy i seem to get this vibe from talking to many bands on the label over the years that they're very they're pretty hands-off in terms of until you hand them something so you know you're a veteran band nobody needs to tell you how to make a record that sounds like darkest hour but i think it's refreshing that there there's labels in this day and age that are you know fairly hands off no pressure they let you do your thing and then when it's time to you know come together and iron out details that's that's where that's where the business end comes in you know yeah they've been really perfect in that you know for that reason um you know like you said we've we've been doing this a really long time you know we're now at a point where we're kind of back to our doing everything ourselves you know we're managing our, ourselves producing ourselves um and so it was kind of the perfect marriage with them because they're, you know, they are really, I think, I'm sure they have younger bands that they develop, but with us, you know, we'd actually worked with some of them before. Some of them used to work here at uh, E1 who put out uh, The Human Romance. So we're already familiar with the guys and it was, it's just been like really the ideal working situation with them. Right on. They do as a, as on the journo side, they have a tremendous amount of consistency at that label. Uh, they don't have a lot of attrition and uh, same great team doing the PR on both sides of the pond. We work across the world. So with our universal team here, our global reviews team. So I'm always pumped when there's a Darkest Hour record. And uh, again, I'm stoked. Uh, E1's done a very nice job kind of pumping it up and pushing it out. So I hope you feel the same. Yeah, yeah. We couldn't be happier. It's really been awesome working with them. Yeah, there's, it's funny, I do get a lot of kind of blowback from fans that feel like, you know, maybe our, our elk is passe, like maybe reviews don't matter anymore. And uh, maybe websites that do music news are shitty, and we don't count anymore. Hopefully, 
that's not the case. But in general, do you still read reviews of your band or of shows or of albums? Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, I, I'd much rather read an album review than like a comment section or something. So it's it's you know, music journalism is still something that we appreciate for sure. I think it's something that is you know needed in the world for sure. Yeah, I was personally bummed uh, to see Pitchfork kind of get absorbed by GQ, and I never want to see masses of people laid off, which happened all over the place uh, lately, um, especially at uh, media companies laying off everybody. And, uh, you know, I don't want to see any of my brethren, like, let go or, lo you know, lose a job. And at the same time, people are like, well, I can read a Reddit thread and know everything I need to know, or I have Wikipedia, or I have YouTube. And I do feel like, you know, we're in a precarious place where if you lose, you know, we do something different than just fan reactions. You know, we, we actually have a seasoned staff. We do a lot of critique. We did 606 reviews last year. I don't even know anybody else that's doing that for a basically volunteer website, but we're nuts. What can I say? We're crazy. Anyhow, thanks for chiming in on that. I appreciate that. A little self, self uh, introspection here again at the end of the week of another week of this. Yeah, man, what a killer record. Uh, like I said, there's some absolutely... Some some songs feel just like very punchy, old school, hardcore. And then there's some stuff that's just like absolutely beautifully grandiose in the best way possible. You know, I feel like as bands get older, they don't edit themselves. But I also feel like listening to this record, there must be some self editing going on to, to make this, you know, end result so strong. Definitely. I mean, you know, we we wrote these songs over and over again. We, you know, we tore them apart and put them back together. We took pieces out of songs and that ended up working better for other songs. Uh, it's really been, you know, it was really like solving this intricate puzzle, putting this together, you know, finding out after we write one song, thinking about what, what the next song should be like and kind of piecing it all together was really a lot of work, but it was, it was really fun and rewarding. Awesome. And you mentioned the self-producing and sort of DIY ethos of this album and maybe back to basics from the beginning of the band. Uh, do you have to kind of pull yourself out to produce yourself? Do you give your, you know, do you have a process where it's like, okay, I'm going to let somebody else run the dials on my vocals and I know how I want them to sound? Or is it a collaborative team effort from the whole band? Um, yeah, I mean... I, w I would say we, it's more like you have to be your own engineer a lot of times. And, um, but it, you know, we've, we've demoed all these songs, like with, you know, Mike's the primary songwriter of the band. He's me and him are the two original members. So it was a lot about, um, you know, him arranging the stuff and then us getting together and figuring out like, once I put the vocals on, you know, how it should change or, you know, what part should go where. So it was, yeah, it was, and but everybody had a say in this record. You know, every every all of us played like an important role in putting it together. And it was, um, yeah, just it took forever. <laughs> but like I said, it was, I think it's totally worth it. Right on. Well, the whole world uh, has taken for you know we're all still kind of working our way through whatever the rest of life looks like uh, in this era. It's been it's been a weird couple of years. I gotta say, I, again, I hope everybody in the band is okay and uh you know we lost some folks along the way friends peers family so uh i feel like we're on the other side i will say like that night and uh that show was very life affirming uh that night i definitely hugged way too many people and paid the price afterwards but uh it was magical that tour was great and uh, it was uh you guys toxic holocaust and darkness everywhere who i love out here in the bay uh it felt like it felt like family you know it was a killer night that was really that was a special one for sure like that was a really you know i had family come out to the show and um they got covid but hey you know, uh, I, did too. I, don't know that's, I don't know if that's what yeah yeah i guess it was going around the room yeah it was uh, it, it was a it was like we hit like a peak and I was like, I'm not going to stop going to shows. And, and I definitely, like I said, I saw too many friends that night. I hugged too many people. But in the moment, it was wonderful. And I don't, I don't blame venues, music, or bands. You know, I make my own choices. And, uh, you know, I live with the consequences like a grown-up. This is what adult looks like, adulting. But, uh, yeah, fantastic time. And, again, the band is still killer live. So I can't wait to hear some of these new songs. Make it into the future set list. Man, I can't wait to play them. It's coming up here in a couple weeks. Right on. That's why I'm glad we fit this in. Let us 
pivot over to a little track by track rundown, whatever you feel like sharing. I'm sure people would love to hear any insights you have to share. Don't have to reveal everything if you don't want to, but we're game for whatever. I'll just shout out the titles and you flow on whatever you want to share. Sure. Let's do it. So obviously the album starts with the title track, Perpetual Terminal. Yeah, this one, um, you know, we say to ourselves that this one is kind of the, and one of the reasons we put it first was it's kind of the entire history of the band like in one song and it's kind of like a almost an album in itself uh just compressed into one song and i know it's long and it seemed kind of weird to put such a long song as the first one but that was really the the vibe we were going for for that one right on there's plenty of punk rock album openers that that go hard and quick so don't worry about it it's all good i love the track um, well, the hard and quick is the second song. <laughs> exactly. I, uh, societal so. bite. Yeah, societal bile. A, a fantastic track. Great lyrics. Uh, let me know what, what your thoughts are on this one. This one, this is probably my favorite of the heavier songs. Um, you know, it's just kind of like really, this is the the punk rock side of the band. This is like, you know, and which is kind of how I got into music. So it was a really special song for me. Uh, yeah, that's probably the one I'm looking forward to playing live the most, I think. Killer. I can't wait to hear it. The third track is A Prayer to the Holy Death. Yeah, this one was kind of, um, you know, we wanted to introduce a lot more melody back into the band. I think after Godless Prophets, you know, was such a dark and pissed off kind of record, we wanted to really bring that, you know, we all love stuff like In Flames and this, you know, melodic death metal. So this was kind of like, okay, we're still doing this kind of music too, you know? Rad, I love to hear it. The Nihilist Undone is the next song. All right, this was kind of like the, you know, the return of the Godless Prophets, like super pissed off, but in a different way than Societal Bile, a little more of like, a little more technical, you know, we wanted to kind of showcase that these guys in the band can like really play their instruments. Um, So that's kind of like the, the heavier technical side of the album, I think. Absolutely. And uh, yeah, everybody came to play and play their best on here. I'm sure people will agree with me. The next track is One with the Void. This one is my favorite. It's um, probably, I would say it's my favorite on the album overall. It's my, uh, it's, you know, we really wanted to kind of push the envelope with the melodic stuff. And we wanted to do something that was if Prayer for the Holy Death is like melodic death metal, this one is just kind of like, I don't want to say rock, but it is kind of like, um, you know, different than that vibe. It doesn't, to us, it doesn't sound like death metal at all. It just death metal at all. It sounds like, uh, you know, almost like post rocky or just, you know, cause we all have different kinds of music that we listen to. So trying to fit that into Darkest Hour is always something fun that we like to do. And I don't know, I just like to sing pretty sometimes and this one was kind of a a chance to showcase that yeah man it's got some beautiful uh melodies on there you still got the pipes dude i love it uh definitely one of the better ones uh or best ones amor fati is the next one that's a fatal love in latin for people who don't have their translator on yeah this was this one was really cool it came about um you know uh nico has had a lot to do with a lot of writing these songs this was from a session. I wasn't around for this session, but Nico went to DC to work with Mike and they were jamming. They were, you know, working on a song and Mike just had the tape rolling and Nico just starts playing this, like improvising this solo basically. And, you know, after Nico left, Mike was re-listening to it and he was like, man, you know what? This, um, this just needs to like be its own song. So it kind of turned into, um, what was going to be, a uh, full song with vocals and everything into just this like uh, instrumental piece. And it kind of works really nice as like an interlude for the record. It kind of gives the listener a break. And so you don't have to hear me screaming at you the whole time. Ah, spoken like every front man. Uh, it does break up the record nicely. I wonder where it falls with the vinyl, uh, but we'll, we'll find out. We'll find out soon. Uh, we'll get your pre-order. And the title, but I'm it makes it. that tracks if that's right. Uh, and then it, nicely goes into love is fear the next song yeah this one was um really really fun to write we kind of this one we we you know we've always been inspired by different kinds of metal so we've been into 
I mean, we started as like a as like a metallic hardcore band. So we were really into punk rock, hardcore. Um, obviously, melodic death metal has had a huge influence. But, you know, we also, Mike especially, grew up listening to a lot of thrash metal. So this was kind of like our nod to the thrash metal influ influences of the band. Um, and it's another one that I'm really super looking forward to playing live. Definitely a riff fest. Uh, New Utopian Dream is the next track. Yeah, this one was, um, you know, we had all these, this was one of the last songs that we wrote. If not, I think it was the last song. Um, but we had, you know, at this point we had a lot of fast stuff. We had a lot of melodic stuff. We had a lot of heavy stuff. Um, we didn't really have any kind of like slower songs or mid-tempo songs. So we kind of wrote this one around the idea of having like um, just a slower, heavy song. You know, we're, we also really like slow metal as well, as well as fast metal. So this was this was our chance to like get slow and sludgy and heavy and then also have a little bit of a melody in with the chorus too. So this was, yeah, it was the last song that really came together on the album. Oh, nice. There's no shortage of great doomy bands from your area. So maybe, maybe there's some residual uh rubbing off on you guys uh my favorite track on the album is the next one mausoleum it is so heavy it's crazy cool um that one that one's uh pretty unique like it came uh it was uh, i think it was that was the second to last one that we had and um you know i wanted to do some more singing stuff and you know, we were sitting around trying to figure it out and i was like because you know i i have uh, other projects that i do like acoustic singing stuff and and I was like, uh, hey, I got this song I've been working on. Uh, let's check, let's try it out. So the, you know, the beginning of the song is, was like a song that I was working on for another project and um, that I already had a lot of the lyrics for. And then we got together and we kind of figured out a way to make it a whole band song. And um, you know, Nico had a lot of co-writing on that song too. So we, <clears throat> it was a really nice mix of, you know, having a, singers you know kind of more of a singer songwriter type song kind of morph into like uh this epic vibe that and uh glad you like that one yeah word and nico is a genius dude uh i follow his whole career i met him when he was with suicidal i followed him here when he was with fallujah in the bay area guy is on he's got an unbelievable musical vocabulary and that's in the band with mike so like yeah you know crazy you guys are <clears throat> riches of you know spoiled with riches yeah those two together it's really a great combo i mean uh you know mike is definitely a little more of the self-taught kind of that comes from the punk and hardcore school whereas nico is a little more um classically trained you know he's been to music school he knows what all the notes are and everything you know he, he's he's really so that that marriage of like um you know kind of punk style and technical technical style is is really kind of the ideal i think for this band indeed indeed the next to last track is my only regret i wish i only had one regret <laughs> i mean there's probably more i guess but that's just just the way the lyric the lyrics sometimes the lyrics kind of drive a a song you know um yeah this was just another nod to like the history of the band and the the kind of more pissed off punk rock side you know i feel like every one of our records near the end we have this we're like man we need just like a, a punk song you know and that's kind of like where we went with that we just wanted like a, a straight punk rock song just to kind of showcase that side of our influence right on and then finally with another long boy to end the record uh i want to read this correctly so i don't fuck it up goddess of war give me something to die for yeah i think that was that one was kind of like we felt like it really bookended um you know, it had the same similar vibe as the first song where it kind of goes on this journey. And um, so we felt like that was kind of the perfect way to to wrap it up. Like it, it's almost like the first song and the last song have like a really similar vibe. So that was kind of where we were going with that. I felt that it does make a nice bookend uh, for uh, for those listening on repeat on streaming services that might get a little a little deja vu there uh killer job thank you so much for sharing and unpacking all that with us i really appreciate it i only have two left for you 
Uh, one is a, a fun one. I, I Whenever I'm going to interview somebody, I go back through the catalog. And obviously, like I said, I have a very deep association with a lot of these records. But I'm going to talk about for a second an underrated record. Ten years ago this year was the self-titled record, which definitely was like a left turn for the band. And at the mm -hmm. time, I think people were like, what is happening to my favorite band? But I love that record personally. So I just wanted to see if you, you know, I, I'm, yeah, I've had enough anniversary tours and I'm sure there are big ones coming up in the next few years also. But I just, we're wondering where you sit with that album now, 10 years later. Um, <clears throat> yeah, there, you know, it was kind of uh, tumultuous making it. We took, we took a long time to make it. Um, and we had a lot of influence from, you know, label, from management, from just everyone involved kind of, you know, we kind of opened ourselves up to, you know, we wanted that. We wanted like, you know, some, 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 some other, some outside power to be kind of guiding the band. And, uh, you know, I think a lot of it worked and there's a lot of it that we, there's a lot of songs off that record that I really, really love. Um, and there's some that I feel like didn't work so great. And, uh, you know, when I hear them back, I'm just like, holy shit, I can't believe that's the Darkest Hour song, you know? So I don't know. I think someday it would be cool to do like, um, I don't know, a director's cut of that album and make, you know, trim it down a little bit. Because I think we really just, we, I don't know if I want to, I don't know if I, I don't know if you want to say we overdid it, but it felt like we, we, we almost took too long to make that you know we almost put too much we rewrote the songs over and over again but not necessarily in a good way it was um so yeah it was a learning experience and you know it was still really proud of a lot of that stuff that was really the you know pushing it pushing ourselves to go super melodic on a lot of those tracks and um yes we still play a few of those songs and i still love a few of those songs um so yeah it was a, a learning experience as each record should be, I feel like. Killer. And I always like to end with a wild card question, and I try to pick them out, especially for my guests. So the one I have for you, hopefully it's not going to stump you, but uh, three books you can't live without. Three books I can't live without. Okay. Um, my first would be uh, one of my favorites of all time, Still Life with Woodpecker by Tom Robbins. He was uh, this author I got into when I was in my early 20s, and I really liked he had this kind of lyrical approach and um that was something that really was the first time i kind of like you know when you're reading it sometimes you can almost sing it it sounds like that kind of poetic so that was a really special book for me um one of the first books that got me into reading was world according to garp john irving that was kind of like a you know a real coming of age one that that hit you know that hit me really hard and um well, let's say I'll go for a recent one now. I've been getting super back into Kurt Vonnegut. I've been reading. I'm starting like a, I started with his first book and I'm now kind of in the middle. But uh, I think the Mother Night was like this kind of underrated one of his. I was reading it and like I just kept taking pictures of quotes from it with my phone. You know, it was, all, you know, it was almost like a way of highlighting quotes. I just felt there were so many quotes in that book that are just super poetic and almost... Uh, almost like lyrical, like the Tom Robbins. Um, and that, that always kind of speaks to me. So, totally killer, yeah, man. I'm, man I'm, I'm glad I could remember three. <laughs> hey, awesome. Uh, thank you for sharing. I really appreciate it. Thanks for hanging out with Ghost Call today, man. And congratulations on the new album coming out February 23rd. It's right around the corner on Monarch Heavy, Perpetual Terminal by Darkest Hour. John, thanks so much, man. Thanks for the interview, man. Hope to All see right. you soon. See you soon. All right.